I always like to start uh, any presentation when I'm dealing with uh, an invasive species, uh, just with a definition of what I'm talking about when I use that term invasive species, just so we're all on the same page. And when I use that, I'm talking specifically about a species that is not native to that ecosystem. It wasn't naturally found there. It didn't migrate on its own. It's not a normal part of that ecosystem, but it has since been introduced into that ecosystem and has escaped and then naturalized, which just means that it forms these free living populations that get take care of themselves. And then that, that non-native, that exotic species that's now naturalized on the landscape has to do um, something that we perceive as negative. It has to have some consequence of it being in the landscape, uh, some alteration uh, of parts of the landscape that are contrary to what we want. So some, some negative uh, environmental damage, ecological damage, economic, something that's um, as a result of it being on the landscape is negative, it's bad. So if a species kind of hits all three of those, those characteristics, it's non-native, it's now out on the landscape and it's causing some negative changes to our environment. That's what I consider an invasive species. And so there's a lot of species that are exotic and escaped, but don't really do any damage. There's even some native species that'll kind of get out of whack sometime, but I don't consider those invasive. So I'm, I'm talking about this kind of specific group of species. And we have those in Illinois, kind of in any habitat, right? And so there's also all taxa. Not only do we have exotic worms, uh, invasive worms, we also have invasive plants, diseases, both of diseases of plants and diseases of animals, invasive insects, invasive mammals, invasive fish. So this is a, a big, broad topic out there, um, invasive species of which jumping worms are, are definitely one of them. And if you can tell just by listening to me, I am not a native Illinoisan. I grew up in the South. And so my introduction to uh, this idea of invasive species was kudzu. And so I'm sure any of you that spend any time in the South know what kudzu is. If you're not, uh, if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's often called the vine that ate the South. And there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres of it spread throughout even up into Illinois and it just covers acres and acres and can top trees and so this was something that if you grew up in that area you kind of instinctively knew that it was it was a different it was causing some kind of problems and so when you talked about invasives you just had to say you know like kudzu and a lot of people kind of understood what you were talking about um, here here in Illinois I kind of think that that poster child or that that species that kind of everybody knows a little bit about, um, even if they're not familiar with, with invasive species, they kind of heard of this species and know it's a problem, uh, would be the silver carp, right? We've all seen those videos of the carp jumping and hitting people when they're trying to boat or water ski. So I think it's really a poster child invasive for Illinois right now that people that um, kind of all walks of life, no matter where they're at in the state, kind of know that they're an issue and they're a problem. And, and that's a good way to, of demonstrating uh, an invasive in Illinois, I think so. But we're not here to talk about plants or silver carp. We're here to talk about jumping worms. And that's something that has gotten a lot of press lately. You can go online and uh, or in, in newspapers nowadays and you see a lot of articles out there um, about jumping worms. I think it's something that catches people's eye because they're a little different. The name's kind of funny. And so uh, you get a lot of press about them. And every time there's press about them, uh, we end up getting a lot of questions about jumping worms out there. And in fact, uh, Extension has written a lot of different articles out there and done some publications on jumping worms. Um, so if you go onto our website and you see there's quite a few out there or we serve as um, sources for other uh, publications, reporters and things on jumping worms. And so again, it's a pretty popular topic. Um, I like the one, the second one from the top there on the left. Uh, this was an article that I was interviewed for and it, it taught me to be careful 
uh, how you phrase things when you're doing an interview. And so I, I said an offhand comment during this uh, talk to a reporter that, oh, yeah, jumping worms, if you get into the Chicago region, they're basically everywhere, which I meant that they're fairly widespread and, and um, they're not localized as much as they used to be. But that little offhand comment ended up becoming the title of the whole article. They're basically everywhere. So it, it taught me to be careful and be a little more um, considerate of exactly what I'm saying when I'm on the record. Um, but uh, it was still a, a, a lot of press about jumping worms. And so because there's so much press out there and it's an interesting topic, it's something that, we're, that we extension are getting asked a lot more about and, and, and there's a lot more interest in, in presentations, a lot more interest in more publications out there. And so that's another reason why I'm very happy to do this presentation here and talk to you all about jumping worms today and hopefully give you a little more information and background about them so you understand uh, more about the issue and some ways that you can help out. So what I'm hoping to do today for this presentation is really to give you an update on what we know about jumping worms in Illinois, where they're at, how are they spreading, um, some of those things, just to catch you up to date on the status of these and then talk a little bit about some recent research uh, on jumping worms that's happening in Illinois and in adjacent states, um, particularly on kind of what impacts they do and what are the consequences of having jumping worms on the landscape. And then, you know, really, I hope that everybody listening in can be better equipped with knowledge um, necessary to recognize jumping worms, know what they look like, know how to tell them from other worm species. Uh, know where to report them if you find suspect populations in new areas of Illinois, as well as just know what to do to kind of keep from spreading them around or, um, or, or kind of adding to the problem. You'll notice that I didn't say a lot about managing them, and we'll get into that in, in detail later, but it is a tricky part with jumping worms right now is um, knowing just how to manage them if we want to get them off the landscape. But let's go all the way back when we're talking about worms and jumping worms, we need to go all the way back to the glaciation of Illinois. And so that seems like a long way to go back, but it is important. And so as you all know, the majority of Illinois has experienced several um, glacial periods that where the landscape was largely covered in a sheet of ice 500 to 1000 feet thick. So this had big consequences ecologically for Illinois and in particular with earthworms. And so uh, earthworms obviously were pushed out of those areas uh, under the glaciers when they were glaciated and they were slow to recolonize. And because of this, uh, our ecosystems in Illinois following glaciation, particularly following the Wisconsin glaciation, which was about 12,000 years ago, um, was really slow to recolonize with earthworms. Um, once they were pushed out, they didn't readily move back. And because of this, a lot of the Midwest, a lot of the upper Midwest, including uh, big portions of Illinois, you know, really haven't historically had native earthworms. Um, over the last 10,000 years, 12,000 years uh, or so, uh, we don't, we haven't had them here. And so our ecosystems um, developed and our communities formed largely in the absence of, of earthworms. There are a few earthworms native to the state, um, but the vast majority of earthworms that you would find out on the landscape, um, whether they're jumping worms or they're night crawlers or, or red wigglers or any of these are in fact exotic to Illinois. They're either European um, or Asian of origin. So there's very few native species of earthworms kind of found in Illinois. In fact, if you look at the, the data out there, uh, earthworms in general are not a very diverse group in the state. Uh, in fact, there's been only what I could find based on a 2011 report, only about 38 species total of earthworms found in Illinois. Now compare that to something like birds, which would be what, 700. Plants, you're looking at you know, close to 4,000. 
uh, butterflies. You're up there in six, 700 as well. Um, and just 38 species of earthworms in Illinois. So it's not a very diverse group. Um, and in fact, of those 38 species, 20 of them are considered to be introduced to Illinois. So they're exotic species in Illinois. So that only leaves about 18 species that have what we consider native earthworms in the state. So again, a very small um, a group of organisms in terms of diversity. But worms in general, they, um, they eat dirt, they eat organic matter, they're detritivorous, which means they feed on dead organic matter. So that could be uh, dead roots, it could be uh, dead leaf litter or duff, things like that. Um, they actually can eat the organic matter straight out of the soil, so they're geophagous that way. And so that's um, how they feed. They, they're not very efficient, so they have to feed a lot. And so they eat a lot to be able to process and get um, nutrients and energy out of kind of a lower quality food source that they eat. And so that's in some ways why we like worms, because they're very good at being those primary decomposers and taking or, uh, organic matter, leaf litter, and, and things like that, and taking the first round at breaking that down and making that um, fertility, those nutrients, and, and uh, that organic matter more available to our plants. That's why we like worms um, to do that, and that's kind of a role they play. But they, they are kind of different general clades or functional groups of worms. And so there's some worms uh, that really focus their time just on the leaf litter, right? And so they stay in the leaf litter kind of at the main top of the soil. There's other earthworms out there that really do uh, uh, stay in that top soil layer. So just in the first few inches of soil. And there's other worms that can go much deeper and actually get into the subsoil or closer to the kind of mineral layers. I um, mean, these are just ways that earthworms kind of break up their um, their habitat, right? They can they can partition themselves out into these different areas of where they feed or spend their time. And jumping worms kind of fall into those first two uh, functional groups. So they spend their time in the leaf litter a lot, but also in that topsoil. And they very rarely go down into the subsoil. In fact, I think it's only in droughty conditions uh, really dry conditions where they go down to kind of avoid desiccating and they try to find moisture. The vast majority of time um, they stay in that top couple inches of soil and in the active um, leaf, leaf litter is where you'll find um, jumping worms at. So these jumping worms, again, they're non-native earthworms, and we're seeing them associated with some big ecosystem impacts, um, particularly to the soil, soil structure, soil fertility. Uh, we'll get into that a lot later, but that's really where we're seeing the impacts of these jumping worms are to our soil. And they've been found in several areas of the United States, um, quite a bit of states right now. And we're seeing increased reports over the last few years in Illinois. Uh, which is why we're concerned about them and we're trying to track them in the state. And we'll get into where they're at in Illinois uh, later in the presentation. But let's just talk a little bit about jumping worms and, and kind of understand what they are and, and um, what they aren't. And previous uh, till the last few years, most of people thought that the Midwestern jumping worms were really one species, Amethyst agrestis. And the more that we've looked at it and the more that people study them, really it's not just one species. Our jumping worms that we're dealing with are actually a closely related complex of about three species. And so there's two in that genus, the Amethyst genus. Uh, so they're Amethyst agrestis and Poikiensis. And there's another one that's been moved over to a, another uh, genus, the Metifier genus. Uh, Metifier Hilgendorfi. And so these three species are uh, closely related. They look a lot alike. And in fact, you kind of have to practically dissect them to be able to tell the three apart. So we tend to call them all just jumping worms as a complex or a lump. So when we talk about jumping worms, um, we're, mentioned, we're basically talking about anything that falls into these three species. And in fact, when they've been looked at, a lot of times they 
are in close association with each other. So you'll find more than one species at a time often um, in an area. So, so that's why we kind of lump them. Their, their problems are the same. The ecology is similar enough that just know when we say jumping worms, we're talking about this group of worms kind of collectively. And you may have heard other names out there, um, snake worms, Alabama jumpers, crazy worms. There's a lot of names out there for these. Um, in general, we call them jumping worms. Uh, it's just kind of a, as a good name there, but just know that if you look in the literature or out there, there's a bunch of other names that you may come across as well. And so there's a lot of states out there that have reported jumping worm populations. Um, this is a little older map. I'm sure now that Indiana has probably found them in there. Um, they're being spread around. So they're, they're being recognized now as a more widespread issue than we previously thought. And, you know, again, in Illinois, we have a couple publications out there. This is one of our more recent ones that kind of goes into detail. So you can find that at our website, extension.illinois.edu. But we put this web, this uh, publication out to get more information and try to get people to, to um, report jumping worms and just know more about them. And so we'll kind of go over the details in this publication plus more, but just know that that's um, one of our publications that we put together when we started discovering jumping worms in, this, in the state. So how do you tell a jumping worm from any other worm out there? And the nice thing is there's several characteristics that are fairly consistent with jumping worms that make them easy to, to distinguish from um, other similar size jump worm, similar size worms. And so jumping worms in general are, they can get pretty big, right? So I've seen them commonly up to eight inches long, sometimes even all the way up to a foot. Um, they tend to be darker on the top than the bottom, which is kind of, it's hard to figure out what the top and a bottom of a worm is, but overall they tend to be slightly darker. They're a very glossy worm, so they kind of shine or glossy um, that stands out instead of a kind of a matte or a dull color. It really jumps out almost like an iridescence, if you will, if it's in the light. It's also a rigid stiff worm. It holds its shape more so than like a night crawler, which can change shapes and is little uh, um, flat, if you will. Um, so the big thing about jumping worms are they're very active and that's where they get their name. If you touch them, you disturb them, try to pick them up, they will thrash wildly uh, when you, you do that. And um, in fact, they thrash so wildly that they can even break in half or shed their tail almost like a lizard can. It's really weird when they do that. And the other thing, and I hear this a lot from people that first see them, is they think they're actually small snakes. So instead of um, contracting and expanding almost like an inchworm or something like a lot of worms will do, they'll stretch out and then fatten up and shorten and stretch out. Jumping worms don't do that as much. Instead, they kind of go back and forth um, crawling like a snake crawls, right? Like kind of in a sidewinder or an S pattern. Um, and you'll see them sometimes crawling on top of the soil um, this undulating going back and forth like a little snake. And so that really stands out as a movement or an, an action that makes jumping worms differ from a lot of these other worms. We'll have a little video here from Wisconsin, if I can get it to play. Uh, it's just a few seconds, but hopefully it will play and you can see some uh, of the movement of some of these worms. So let's watch it for a minute here. So hopefully you could see those worms undulating back and forth and sliding and then flipping around when they were touched and bothered. Um, those are uh, kind of good characteristics. Well, let me go back up to here. So uh, 
another thing to kind of focus on when you have a worm in hand and you want to make sure that it is a jumping worm is this band. And so this band is called the clitellum on a worm. And so with jumping worms, it's a little different than um, a lot of the other worms out there. And so on jumping worms, that band can vary in color, but oftentimes it's kind of milky white or light in color or light brown in color. And then this band also on jumping worms is roughly the same size as the rest of the worm. So on a lot of worms, this band, this clitellum is inflated or larger. So it'll be bigger in diameter than the rest of the worm. Um, but in jumping worms, it's kind of the same size as the rest of the worm. And then also, if you move the worm and look at all sides of this band, it's an entire band. It's not broken. It completely encircles the worm. And then if you look at night crawlers or some of these other bigger worms, their clitellum, if you flip them over, it'll be, it'll have a seam on the bottom. So it'll actually be incomplete. It won't be all the way around the worm. It'll have a noticeable break or seam at the bottom of it. And so that's another good characteristic. So when you see this, look for it being the same diameter as the worm, it being entire in terms of it's all the way around and there's no broken seam. And it may be well, milky white in color, but it could also be all the way from that to dark brown. But then also where it is on the worm. And so this band on a jumping worm starts around the 14th segment of the worm, um, which is pretty far up closer to the front of the worm. Where in a lot of other worms, the clitellum starts back past the 20th segment. So it's much farther back on the worm. So that's another way to kind of distinguish them. So let's just look at another picture here. You can see that clitellum is smooth in terms of it's not raised, it's not bigger than the rest of the worm. It's kind of that milky white color. You can see the worm is very stiff, um, shiny and a dark color as well. Here's a worm that was sitting on my desk a couple years ago when it was sent to me. Um, and again, you can see that band is far up on the, towards the front of the worm. It's the same diameter. Um, as the rest of the worm and kind of that milky white coloration. And then again, you know, understanding the segments and where this, uh, these start to me, um, if you get a worm, it's going to be moving, it's going to be stretching and shrinking some, and it's really hard to kind of count that. So I actually prefer to take a picture of the front of the worm, and that helps me identify each of the segment and count them easier than dealing with a live worm. So, so this worm, I ended up taking a picture and I'll just show you here. Um, you can see all these noticeable segments, right? Earthworms are segmented, they're broken into these little segments. And so you can count them. And so this one, if you counted it all the way back from the front of the worm back to where that clitellum starts, you see it's right at that 14th segment. There's 13 segments of the worm in front of um, the clitellum. And so this is very different than a lot of the other worms out there. Um, it's much farther forward on the worm. The other thing that you can pick out on sometimes when you have a population of jumping worms would be the soil and the way it looks. So we found that sometimes, but not always, they tend to um, produce this kind of unique soil signature. And the reason why is that more and more of that upper layer of the soil is made up from their worm castings. And so you tend to get these big aggregates in your soil, these big clumps. And so some people describe that as coffee grounds. Um, some people describe it just as, you know, clumpy, something like that. But these large aggregates, this kind of coffee ground um, style of, of soil can be a good indication that you have jumping worms. Now, I've seen this happen more often in higher organic um, a content soil. So there's a lot of organic matter in those soils. It's a rich soil. It tends to um, be able to do this more. When I've seen jumping worms in heavy clay or poor soils, they don't tend to produce this kind of soil signature as readily. But in good soils, um, you certainly can see this kind of coffee ground look like that. Here's another look at some of it um, in a flower bed where you can start to see those coffee ground styles there. And again, that's a good indication that you may have jumping worms.
But let's compare that to a European earthworm, which is another one of our bigger worms that you'll see uh, in Illinois. Um, one right away, you can tell this worm is, uh, it's kind of different shaped. It's not quite as stiff and round as a jumping worm, not as dark as the jumping worm. But also you can see that clitellum, that band is definitely bigger than the rest of the worm and it's farther back on the worm itself. See, it starts beyond that segment number 20. It's pinkish in color, it's raised. And so to me, it's very obviously uh, not a jumping worm from all of those characteristics. Another look here, uh, jumping worm on the right and uh, a night crawler on the left. This one doesn't have as obvious of a raised clitellum that night crawler doesn't, but you can still see that it starts way back on that worm as compared to uh, the jumping worm on the right. Once you see them enough, they're really easy to pick up, pick out um, basically just by behavior, their movements, um, they, the, the way that they react to being exposed instead of high, you know, shrinking back, they tend to move through and try to run away. Um, their wild thrashing behavior that all jumps out to you that it, um, it, it's pretty easy to pick them out once you see them a lot. In terms of biology, um, jumping worms, you know, again, they primarily live in that upper layer of soil or that leaf litter where they feed on that leaf litter, feed on detritus, organic matter. Um, they are parthenogenic, which means they're able to reproduce without mating. Um, so they're very easy to create a new population, even from just one worm. And they, adults, especially in Northern Illinois, tend to die in cold conditions in winter. So they're often described as an annual worm that only live through the winter um, via eggs. Um, that's not always the case, at least in my experience in the southern part of Illinois. I believe that uh, our winters aren't harsh enough that we often have a lot of jumping worms in their adult stages that can uh, survive our winter. So I've found jumping worms every month of the year down here. But in uh, the northern half of the state, I would say it pretty much holds true that uh, through the winter, most of the adults are going to die off. Now, they shed uh, microscopic cocoons. And so cocoons is basically an egg sac that's hardened. Um, and these little egg sacs, they're really small. You can't really pick them out. They're hard to tell what they are, uh, but they can hold multiple eggs. And again, they're hard. And so they overwinter with those. Those cocoons can take a um, very cold conditions and not... Um, not die that way. So it seems to be very effective method of overwintering are these little cocoon, egg cocoons that they, they shed. Jumping worms in general can reach maturity fairly quickly. Uh, some reports say half the time is European earthworms. And so you'll have two, maybe more hatches per season. And that lets them build up these densities really high over the course of the season. So by the end of summer, early fall, you can have very, very high densities of jumping worms. Um, and because of this, they're usually visible. And by the time they build up their populations and their sizes enough after spring, you're mostly going to see these in the northern half of the state anyway, kind of June through October. Uh, the southern half of the state, you can pretty much see them any time of the year, uh, as long as it's warm enough for worm activity. Uh, they tend to uh, first appear young hatchlings uh, when the air temperature gets above 50 degrees, die off when the air temperatures fall below 41. Those are just generic generals. Um, it's estimated that it takes anywhere from 70 some to 90 some days to mature from hatching, hatchling to being able to um, produce eggs themselves. Uh, again, those cocoons can survive winter uh, with soil temperatures below negative 20. And they do tend to avoid or move when soil conditions are very dry. That's the time you'll see them go deep into the soil where usually they live in those top layers. And they really like kind of moist, but not permanently wet. So moist soils, but are but well-drained with a lot of fertility in there, a lot of nutrients. Uh, the population densities tend to be the highest in those conditions. In terms of what can these do in, uh, in impacts, uh, there's some really interesting research out there um, looking at kind of mesocosms where they, they put the worms in, they could watch specifically what they did. 
And they found that in some cases it was an 80 to 90% decline in the forest uh, foliage litter mass in these areas. So they just did a wonderful job of eating through all of the, the litter that was on the, the forest floor. And in fact, they went through a, a quarter percent or a 25% decrease in just 80 days by accelerating decomposition, by just eating through all this detritus and leaf litter that was on the, the floor. Now you might say, well, that's kind of what we want worms to do, right? We want them to eat through this stuff and make this nutrients available. And, and that's true to a degree. Uh, the problem is that just the rate and the speed that uh, jumping worms do this. So I like to think of you know, this leaf litter layer and this detritus, this organic matter layer that's, that's on the top layer of the soil, kind of as a nutrient bank. And through slow decomposition, it's releasing these nutrients into this ecosystem, making them available for plants. So there's good nutrient availability throughout the whole year. And then it's replenished with leaf litter fall in the, in the autumn. The problem with jumping worms is that they take this bank, which can be a huge amount of accumulated organic matter and leaf litter that's on the soil surface and eat through that so much faster than, uh, than other worms or otherwise it would happen. And so what you actually get is a huge release of nutrients right away. We have a flush of nutrients available on the landscape um, and then they all move out of the system and they're gone. So instead of the slow release of nutrients over the course of a full season and kind of balancing out the nutrient availability in soils, instead you get a flush of all your nutrients at once, followed by a drastic loss of nutrient availability after that. And that's the biggest problem is it just cycles through everything so quickly and then it's gone. Overall, because of this, it gets a decrease in carbon in your soils overall because of this amazing feeding. And then this thing, remember this coffee ground look, you get this increase in soil aggregate size. And that causes some issues itself, particularly in water holding capacity. So we see these soils being a little more droughty, um, a little more susceptible to drying out. They can't hold water as well. Um, and then as water moving through, it even helps leach those nutrients out of the soils. And so it's kind of a uh, both of those issues, the aggregate size and then the cycling through the nutrients kind of work together to create harder conditions for plants to grow um, in soils that have a lot of jumping worms. This is uh, just some pictures a homeowner sent me um, a couple years ago where uh, his yard was just completely loaded with jumping worms and you can really see the soil signature, the jumping worms were everywhere and it just created these conditions where plants really had a hard time growing. They were large, bare patches of soil, um, missing lawn, these areas, and just loaded with jumping worms. So this is an extreme case, but just kind of show you what can happen in uh, more extreme cases where jumping worms are a problem. Uh, there's been some recent research from the university here on jumping worms. I uh, found that jumping worms increase the metabolic rate of organisms in the soil. So they're releasing more carbon out of the soil, um, releasing more nitrogen from soil storage. And again, just kind of showing that initially you have a lot of fertility available and then you're losing those long-term storage. And then it, that can all lead to a change in soil bacteria, the soil fungi, uh, pH level, soil chemistry. So there's a lot of things going on in the soil due to this kind of different feeding and the different presence of, of jumping worms. And that not only impacts plants being able to grow and, and the nutrient availability, but it can actually impact soil wildlife. And there was some interesting research out of Tennessee showing that um, terrestrial salamanders that live in that leaf litter layer, just like jumping worms do, have a harder time when jumping worms are there because they have to keep moving because the worms just keep eating all their cover. And so they found that in this one study that the salamanders had to move over three times more often um, just to kind of find uh, leaf litter or find cover um, when the jumping worms are present. And that's just a big energy expense. It may impact their ability to find mates and to brood and to rear young. So it was some big changes to um, salamander use and those big changes to millipedes and how millipedes use the soil as well. And so we know that they 
are changing that soil biota. There hasn't been a ton of research on plants out there. There's some uh, on, there's a lot more on European earthworms. We think the changes to the soil are very similar. And so we know that with that, there's been a reduction in herbaceous plant cover, a lot of times invasion by non-native plants. And then we've had just observations from landowners in Illinois that large patches of grass have suddenly started dying. Ornamental plants are struggling. Bare ground is more visible. And one person even said shrubs have actually tipped over. And that might be a bit of hyperbole, but um, basically people are reporting that uh, plants are having a harder time at times. Um, growing with these jumping worms. And there was some research with a grad student out of um, the NREST department working at the Morton Arboretum and found that with tree seedlings and grown in the presence of um, jumping worms, that buckthorn, which is an invasive plant, did a lot better with the jumping worms. And actually sugar maple did better with jumping worms. But oak, white oak in particular, did worse when they were with jumping worms and white pine was just about the same. So again, there's just a lot of different changes going on and we don't really understand them so fully just yet. Um, and then we know that in this eating this layer of soil uh, off the top and changing all this leaf litter can cause the soil to, to um, subside a little bit and it's just going to have a harder time for things to, to grow in there. And, these are, these are pictures from uh, European earthworms in forests, but again, we believe the, the jumping worms are similar impact where you have these bare patches in the soil as the worm population moves through. Now, in terms of spread, we think these worms are spread um, really in anything that can move dirt or can move the worms or especially move their cocoons. So mulch, compost, soil, plants, um, and then directly through like bait and vermiculture as well. Um, what we've seen in, this, in Illinois that we think most of it is either people sharing plants, community mulch piles or community compost piles is probably how a lot of these worms are getting moved around. But you can buy them. So if you go online, you can buy 5,000 Alabama jumpers uh, if you so desire. So there are some still uh, available out there, um, unfortunately. Now, the problem is there's really no current uh, approved control methods out there that we can use to control jumping worms. There is, there is some research going on right now on some different kind of organic uh, lawn fertilizers that can be used as control. There's some research out there with a kind of BT kind of bacterium as another organic control, similar to what people use for um, caterpillars in some cases. And, and there's also some other look at different types of mulch that may deter them. So there's some, there's some research going on right now, but there's nothing currently approved and recommended to control them. So for the time being, once you get them, you kind of got them. And that's one of the problems. In a natural setting, there's a prescribed fire in a forest has been shown to kind of reduce the amount of cocoons that are, are young worms that may be out there, kind of in a temporary situation. But overall, we don't really have good recommendations of how to get rid of them. And, and that's one of our challenges. As such, we do focus a lot on spread prevention. So keeping them from moving around is one of our big talking points. So things like arrive clean, leave clean. If you're working in an area that you know there's jumping worms, knock the soil and the debris from your equipment, from your gardening tools, from your boots. It's just a good idea so you're not moving them around. Looking for jumping worms, knowing what they look like, what the conditions or signs of their presence look like, reporting them in new locations that we don't know they're at, um, using, selling, planting, purchasing, um, anything such as gardening materials, landscape materials, plants that kind of make sure they appear to be free from jumping worms or from an area that doesn't have jumping worms before you move them around. And then watching those kind of community compost piles and mulch piles. Instead, try to find compost that was well managed, kind of commercial available, because those tend to be heated to the appropriate temperatures through their management of these compost piles. So that would be a lower risk um, product that would be less likely to move jumping worms than just an unmanaged community uh, compost pile. 
So overall, uh, jumping worms in the Midwest were really first identified in 2013 in Wisconsin. We were worried at that time, and, and um, once you saw where it was at in southern Wisconsin, we were worried that we might be getting, uh, eventually getting jumping worms from Wisconsin. So we started to look for them um, once they, they were found in Wisconsin and, and, and realized they were in the area. We looked historically at other species in that genus. There was a couple of reports of different Amytha species, not the ones that we consider jumping worms. Um, but two of them were found in greenhouses and reported from greenhouses. And this third one, Hoopiensis, was labeled as being well established in the Champaign Urbana area historically. But other than that, we didn't have records of our jumping worms necessarily in Illinois. So we put together a group uh, of folks that deal with invasive species in general um, to kind of start looking for jumping worms, doing presentations on jumping worms, and really starting to figure out where they're at in the state. And in 2015, we found uh, seven reports. We had seven reports from master gardeners, master naturalists, or homeowners uh, in northeastern Illinois. And so we thought, oh, our, our fears had come true that we are getting them from Wisconsin, right? But the issue is that these reports kept coming in and we started finding them not only in Northeastern Illinois, but kind of across uh, the whole state. So this is kind of our current knowledge of jumping worms. And so the dark blue are sites that we have, or counties that we have verified records for, and the light blue are counties that we suspect, but we don't have a good enough sample to, to tell conclusively. And so uh, this actually really realizing that they're spread really widely throughout the state kind of turned the script on this. Are we worried about getting them from Wisconsin? In fact, probably Wisconsin got them from us is kind of probably what happened. So we have 42 confirmed counties uh, plus five other suspect counties currently in Illinois. And that's up from just three counties in 2015 uh, in 2021 alone, we added 15 new positive counties. So we're getting new reports all the time of these jumping worms in the state. And so the way we find them now is since we, we, we have a good handle on them to find a new county report, um, we verify those, we can verify those through live samples, preserved samples or high quality images or video enough that we can see those characteristics uh, that we need to look at to verify them. And so most of our, our populations are now being verified through those high quality images. And those can be sent directly to me. They can be sent to your local extension office in your county or sent to the um, plant clinic on campus. So all of those, we're kind of all working together. But again, we're getting lots of reports. And these are just a few pictures of reports that we've gotten over the last couple of years of different jumping worms across Illinois. Here's one from Cook County, Stangamon and Will County. Lake County sent us a video of theirs. So if I can get it to play, so they can show their movements and their soil conditions. And then the kind of champion that we found was from way down here in Pope County, which was over 12 inches long. This was actually at a winery um, in the region. And so again, we found them kind of all across the state currently. So I'll end with a few just uh, slides here on plant cells uh, and kind of how that relates to jumping worms. And the question is, should we still be doing plant cells now that we have jumping worms in the state. And I really think it's important to understand the risk involved with plant cells, understand what's at stake and understand kind of the options that are available to you. And so in terms of plant cells risk, you know, high risk uh, activities for a plant cell would be digging and dividing plants that come straight from your yard, um, sharing compost and mulch because you're sharing those uh, dirt that may have the cocoons in them. So those would be very high risk. Uh, medium risk would be root washing plants that are dug and repotted or potting or putting potted plants on the ground that have ground contact. Um, low risk would be plants grown from seed and containers and you're putting those in kind of bot growth medium instead of just dirt from your uh, soil from your yard. 
So there's different levels of risk of what you're trying to sell. And there's things that are like, what's at stake? So it's important to know kind of what's the current spread of jumping worms in your area. If there's no jumping worms in the area and there's none uh, known from the region at all, um, it's a medium risk because you don't know there's any there to move. Um, but of course, are you sure there's none there? there? There might be more and we're finding them more and more. If you have kind of sporadic jumping worms, so there's spotty populations, some here and some not, that's actually more of a high risk because you know they're in the area, but they're not everywhere yet. And in that case, you really have the potential to move them around, right? You're likely to pick them up and likely to spread them. And I would say currently most of the state of Illinois falls in this sporadic um, category where we have populations, um, some bad populations, but they're kind of spotty in the areas. And then the last, if it's an area that has very, very widespread where jumping worms are basically already everywhere, that would actually be more of a low risk where um, since they're already everywhere, spread isn't as much of an issue, right? Um, we don't, I don't know exactly where in Illinois is that the case, but just um, those are just kind of the three categories that I put kind of what's at stake for spreading jumping worms in. And there's options out there for you, right? You can alter your plant cell to focus on medium or low risk activities. Uh, try to focus on starting plants from seeds or root washing and replot, repotting plants into a different bot medium. That's ways to lower the risk um, for plant cells. Education, survey for jumping worms, understanding your risk for sure. And, um, you know, something like sharing among people that they already know they have jumping worms. So uh, there's just things that you can do and different options out there. The big thing for me is to kind of change what you're selling um, and focus on those medium or low risk activities so you're less likely to move jumping worms around is a good way to still have plant cells and still do things, um, but just doing it more responsibly. So uh, in summary, jumping worms are actually a, a complex of several species that are in two genera. They are um, widely established in the United States. They're being rapidly found throughout Illinois right now. We know that they have um, potential to impact soil structure, impact soil fertility, wildlife and, and plant growth. So that's why we're concerned about them. And we're asking for people to report particularly new counties, counties that we don't know jumping worms are at um, to report those populations so we can better understand where they're at in the state. And you're most likely to see them kind of June through October. And with that, uh, I, I guess I'm happy to take any questions if we have any. Um, yeah, so that's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. I learned so much. Um, Good. You, with your presentation, if you wouldn't mind just growing, going to the next slide, that'll have the fall tricks information. Sure. Okay. Next one, right? Yes. All righty. Perfect. So thank you again. I'm putting the link in the chat box. Um, we'll go through the questions now, but if you could fill out the survey, it really helps us and I'm sure it'll help Chris as well.